Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this session dedicated to serving the landscape initiatives against spyware. Um, today, um, we will be talking about spywares as um, sophisticated surveillance tools used to break the security of electronic devices, access their communication and content, and ultimately spy on journalists, lawyers, activists, um, politicians, and potentially anyone using a smartphone or a computer. Uh, they pose a threat to source confidentiality and editorial independence, independence when it comes to journalism, uh, but also to personal safety and personal privacy. Um, during this webinar, we will be discussing what the European institutions are doing in terms of acting to address the problem uh, stemming from the use of such technologies, uh, particularly on behalf of the security agencies. Um, today with us, uh, we have two honored guests, and I have the pleasure to introduce you, uh, Professor Eugenia Seapera, Head of the School of Information and Communication Studies, and Director of the Center of Digital Politics, Policy at the University College Dublin, and Professor Emeritus Dirk Wurhoff from the Human Rights Center at the Faculty of Law and Criminology at the Ghent University. Uh, we will start this discussion um, starting from the European Media Freedom Act, a uh, European uh, legislative uh, initiative that among the different issues, it also tries to tackle um, the problem stemming from spyware and how they can be used or deployed against uh, journalists. Um, I will first ask Professor Vorhoff to uh, help us uh, navigate the origins of the European Media Freedom Act as one of the latest attempts from the European Union to provide a legal protection from intrusive surveillance, and more in general, what we should expect or even pretend from the European institutions and the member states. And if this initiative is going into the right direction, or on the other hand, what are we missing? Um, in the second part, I will ask Professor Siapera a more critical analysis of the European attempts to uh, put a remedy to intrusive surveillance, including spyware, and to help us approaching the issue from a more, let's say, radical perspective, thinking outside the box of the European institutional mindset and move beyond its limit. So Professor Warhoff, please, uh, I will give you the floor and help us understanding what the European Union is doing in addressing this issue or is not doing. Thanks a lot. I think you are muted. Thank you, Dimitri, for the uh, invitation and for the possibility to, to focus on, on an important aspect of the uh, proposal of European Media Freedom Act, which is called the Jan Kusiak Act by uh, Commissioner Jourova this noon in her introduction. Um, the main issues of this act are um, editorial independence, pluralism of the media, strengthening the quality and funding of the public broadcasting service media and a few others. But as a part of the editorial independence, protection of sources is of crucial importance for journalists and media workers so that others, neither authorities, can sniffle into the documents and the information and the communication that journalists are working on. So it is very good that the European Commission, with its proposal, addresses this um, enormous important aspect of journalists working um, protection of sources. Um, and the aim of the proposal is to strengthen and to harmonize protection of sources in Europe. And there's a good reason to do this, both strengthening and harmonizing, because we can see from the case law of the European Court in Strasbourg that many countries do not at a sufficient level actually protect sources of journalists. And secondly, there's quite some differences in the way that the member states of the EU are protecting uh, journalist sources to, to some level. So it, it's very good that this is part of the uh, EMPA proposal and that European court that uh, that European Commission tries something to do about it. But of course, we don't need to start from the scratch. There is already an, uh, a legal framework guaranteeing the protection of journalistic sources, and that is the European Convention on Human Rights, the Article 10 on the right to freedom of expression and information. And all EU member states are a member 
of this convention. So they are already under this obligation. But what we can see is that the, the high level of protection that should be given to protection of sources is not given in many member states. So it's very good that with a regulation, the European uh, institutions would give an extra layer of enforcement because it seems that the binding character of the convention and the recommendations by the committee of ministers are not sufficient. So that's the good, that's the good way. And also the uh, European court has uh, given a very high level to protection of sources, for instance, by requesting that there can only be an, a look into the sources when there is an overriding requirement in the public interest after a judge or a court ex ante in advance have decided that there are sufficient reasons to do that, taking into consideration subsidiarity and, um, and proportionality principles. I'm, I'm trying to, to get my next slide, but yeah, here, here it is. So that, that's a bit the, uh, the start of um, the intention, which is good. When we look at the um, uh, text itself of the um, proposal, more precisely Article 4, uh, one can say there is some disappointment um, because the provision does not really harmonize nor strengthen protection of sources, what it is intended to do so. And very briefly, in the short time that, that is available, I would bring forward six points of criticism where the proposal doesn't go far enough. Uh, it's too general to say that there is protection of sources, um, but without adding concrete conditions and obligations for the member states. There should be an ex ante review and that's not guaranteed by the, um, by the EMFA. There's no reference to the specific um, protection guarantees of protection of sources on subsidiarity and proportionality. There's only protection after a journalist or a media worker has refused to disclose information, but in reality, there are searches and confiscations, there is surveillance without there has been even a request, so not even a refusal. So it leaves too much possibilities for member states not to do anything um, in uh, transposing the, the, the regulation. There are no specific guarantees for online surveillance, uh, whether it is targeted or non-targeted. That, that should be, that's very important, according to a Grand Chamber judgment against the UK of last year, Big Brother Watch. It creates rather a legal basis for deployment of spyware instead of prohibiting it and maybe foresee in very, very specific circumstances with all the guarantees needed, such um, use of um, surveillance technologies. And finally, it, it, it installs or it, it obliges the member state to install a body where journalists can complain when there is an illegal look into their sources, but that would be an opinion afterwards. So that's not strong enough. It should be ex ante, it should be by the judiciary, it must be uh, enforced. So by conclusion, um, very good intention by the EMFA, uh, by the European Commission, but Article 4 will need to be amended to give it a real tool for enforcement. So not only talk the talk, but indeed also walk the walk, so something more will be needed. Thank you very much, Professor Vorho, for this brief, but very concise and clear introduction. And I will give the floor to Professor Siapera. Uh, we saw that there is a sort of inherent conflict between the intentions and the practicalities at EU level maybe stemming also from the necessity to balance different needs, interests, rights, and so on. One of the critical points is this reliance on the concept of national security, which is quite often used by um, legal agencies, police, and so on, to justify the use of intrusive technologies, not only against uh, journalists, but also against activists, politicians, lawyers, and so on. The Media Freedom Consortium also covered many issues and many problems related to this topic. Journalists spied on, uh, Greek journalists spied upon using different spywares, including 
Predator or, or Pegasus from the Israeli company NSO. Uh, the case of um, Spanish citizens spied upon their own government. So governments and legal agencies are the, the main actor when, we, when it comes to talking about this issue. But what I want you to address is the, the higher mindset of the European mindset. So within the European Media Freedom Act, we notice that there is this unsolved inherent conflict. What should we do? Can we have a more radical and critical approach to what the institutions are doing for addressing this issue? Um, thanks, Dimitri, uh, and thank you, Derek, for uh, for this uh, kind of like a brief but but very accurate and, in my opinion, very um, uh, perceptive uh, criticism of uh, of Article Four. Um, I share these um, these views, but I want to adopt a more kind of like a sociological lens. Uh, to interpret um, the whole kind of like act and and Article Four within the act. And, and for this, I would require to take a, maybe a step back from spyware and, and focus more on, uh, I suppose, the principles behind the European Media Freedom Act, which are, include the protection of journalists and, and the safeguarding of editorial independence beyond only the issue of uh, protecting sources, more broadly understanding editorial independence. And to me, it is striking that within the whole kind of like act, it is only Article 4 that refers to the protection of journalists and the safeguarding of editorial independence when it's the most crucial part of, uh, of what journalism is meant to be doing. And I wonder if spyware is the only reason or the, even the main reason for, uh, for compromising editorial uh, independence and media freedom. Uh, and, and here I think that um, uh, research indicates that it, important though as it may be, it's only a very marginal part of how journalism is compromised. Um, in particular, in our sociological research, we found two main uh, reasons why uh, journalists feel that they are compromised. And one of them is their employment status with a lot of journalists in fact having to rely on, on precarious con contracts. And the second is media ownership, uh, not in terms of concentration, but in terms of owners having interest outside the sphere of uh, publication. So we have um, owners that have, for example, interest in the real estate, interest in construction, interest in shipping, and they own newspapers. And then that's how they interfere indirectly in, um, uh, in uh, uh, editorial independence. And in these spyware does play a role because it's not inconceivable that some of these actors uh, I, I mean, not only business owners, but other kind of like commercial interests may employ uh, spyware to um, spy on journalists that are trying to report on them. Uh, and these would be non-state actors uh, doing this. And I wonder to what extent does the, the does Article 4 protect um, journalists uh, from practicing their, um, their, their profession when First of all, there is like their, their livelihood is not protected. Secondly, their, even their personal safety is not protected. And, and thirdly, there is no penalty for people who are using spyware to protect journalists. And I mean this in the sense that the article very briefly states that, okay, we should ban all spyware. Fine, yeah, everyone agrees. But I think that... Um, States, on the one hand, will claim national security interests, so then they will come out of it and scale. And uh, non-states or commercial or other, maybe even criminal uh, interests will just try and hide behind the fact that no one will be able to trace them or it will be very difficult to trace them. So where does that leave journalists, practically speaking? How are they protected? How does the act contribute to protecting them? So I think that we should uh, perhaps look at it, at the problem of media freedom and editorial independence, more from like the actual lived reality of journalists and their day-to-day -day reporting and in the day-to-day -day practices, and then try to maybe um, reflect, try to, to make, um, develop a way of reflecting this practical reality into the language of like, uh, 
the legal language that the, 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 the European instruments are using. I hope that this wasn't too circumscribed a way of like coming to the problem, uh, but I just wanted to infuse some kind of sociological reality into this uh, media freedom act. Thanks a lot, Professor Siapera. I have um, two questions for you, uh, one each, and in order to give us some hope regarding this topic. So the first question for Professor Vorhoff would be, do we have good examples out there? Maybe it's some of the member states are more advanced uh, in terms of legal protections, and those member states should be taken as let's say, a good example or a, some, somehow um, a method to, to address the issue. And to Professor Siapera, giving the sociological background of her, of her speech, I would ask, is there any hope to see a different approach to safety and security beyond this obsession of granular and detailed control, which is the reason behind technologies like spyware. Is there another way to have safety and security combined with privacy and the possibility for journalism to act independently? Hey, uh, Dimitri, maybe first I would like to, to agree with what Eugenia says. The legal protection is certainly not enough. It's a very important layer for source protection and editorial independence. But of course, there should be other measures too. And it's the same, for instance, with whistleblowers. It's very important that they have legal protection, but there should be other instruments too. For instance, also journalists should have the possibility to encrypt um, their material so that, for instance, uh, it would be very difficult or forbidden to uh, circumvent the um, encryption. Also, there is no reference yet in the provision uh, by the uh, by the EMFA. But to answer your question, well, first of all, I think that to be inspired and to amend in a positive and good way Article 4, the European Commission can be inspired by the case law of the European Court and to introduce and to integrate the criteria of that case law and what the court already has seen in developments, also in the digital world on surveillance, to have these criteria and these safeguards into the regulation itself. So that's important. And that can be inspired indeed also by, by some countries, because as I said, quite some countries have been found in violation by the European court because they didn't have a sufficient protection of journalistic sources. And some of these countries after having been, been convicted by the Strasbourg court once and twice, and maybe three times, um, they have taken an initiative, their parliaments, to make a robust uh, protection of journalistic sources. And one of these countries is, is Belgium, who has been convicted in several cases. Another one is the Netherlands, after several convictions. And another one is Luxembourg. All these three countries have been several times been found in violation, and they have upgraded their legislation. And I think Belgium is seen also by other experts as the country with the highest level of protection of journalistic sources, it becomes nearly impossible for any authority to look into the, um, the files and the documents and the data and the communication of journalists, except in very, very exceptional circumstances, which need to be approved in advance by, by a judge. Um, and, and, and that makes that um, we have a solid um, a, a solid protection there. The problem is indeed that sometimes journalists do not know that they are surveilled. Yeah, you refer to it, Dimitri, it can be intelligence and um, security services who work in the secret. It can also be private actors where Eugenia has referred to that, that you don't know. So therefore we need also to look for other ways of, of protection of journalists and to, to be able to detect these kinds of uh, violations of the right to, to protect sources, because it's not only the authorities who should not interfere, eh, but also third and private parties should not do that. There is some legislation, of course, prohibiting this to sanction it also, but um, it's certainly not enough. And uh, I think the regulation, the EMFA would, would give the possibility to go a bit further in trying to find some extra safeguards against these surveillance technologies. Um, yes, uh, if I may have uh, now the 
the floor. I absolutely agree with um, with what Derek has uh, has mentioned. Um, I also think that um, the solution will not come from academics like ourselves. Uh, the solution will come from journalists on the ground. Uh, I think there is there possibly are a lot of best practices circulating among them. So it may be the best way to proceed may be to kind of like um, open up our eyes and our ears to the practices and to what journalists say on the ground uh, in terms of how they themselves um, develop an understanding of what is going on and, and try to protect themselves and then try to diffuse these practices wide, more widely. Uh, and then through their experiences, perhaps we could feed that um, to, um, to other institutions that are tasked with the protection of journalists. I would also say that uh, if the European Commission, if the European Union is serious about journalistic freedom and media freedom and independence, they should really focus on improving the funding model for journalism, because this is really the source of a lot of problems uh, for journalists. And of course, spyware is a, a, a peril, is a danger, it compromises journalism, but you have to contextualize it in terms of other con the conditions for work, for practicing uh, journalism. Um, and in this manner, I think that the act, um, the, the Article 4 in particular, important though as it is uh, in trying to kind of like say, no, you should not be using spyware, it inadvertently creates this narrative that journalism is compromised because of like one or two bad actors and not because of the sociological conditions of practice in the profession that, um, that are really very difficult at the moment for journalists. Uh, so I would say you have to do a lot of things uh, but one of them would definitely be pay attention to what journalists are experiencing. And the second would be pay attention to how journalism is funded, uh, because at the moment is very much open to exploitation um, and to kind of like direct interference by, by commercial and, and political interests. Thank you very much to both of you for helping us navigate the is very important issue and addressing how the European institutions are trying, not very successfully, but are trying to, to put um, a remedy to the situation. And thanks, Eugenia, for allowing me to have this practical take on the topic and, and to remind our audience that uh, tomorrow at 5 p.m. we have um, a digital safety workshop available for anyone who register. Uh, we're, the trainers will teach how to protect um, how journalists can protect themselves from impersonations, hacking, and doxing. It is organized by Pan America and uh, Freedom of the Press Foundation. Thanks a lot for everyone, and I wish you a pleasant journey. <laughs>